Harry, thanks so much for joining me today on the Modern Soccer Coach Podcast. Finally, excited to get you on. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Gary. Really appreciate it and excited to go over some, some interesting topics. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. So we're going to talk, obviously, about the the, the transition, the move to America. So many things. Um, English football as well. Well, coming off Sunday, uh, commiserations, of course. Uh, I'm sure, I'm sure you were gutted about that there. Um, what, what was your overall thoughts on the Euros? I think, uh, I think you know, it's been a really good tournament for everybody. I think, if I'm being honest, I think the Italians deserve to win the whole thing. I think they were the best team in the, in the competition. Um, and you have to congratulate the manager of Italy. And, and in terms of England, from our perspective, you know, we've got to a final. We've gone one step closer to winning it. And I, I think we need to have a, you know, a positive mindset and, and just look at, you know, look how far we've come. We've got some brilliant attacking players um, who play with real good bravery. So I think we just need to be playing them a little bit more. OK, get, getting started and going down this interview, uh, I just told you there before we started recording that, I think it's sometimes we look at the at the the two different games, the senior game and the the youth game as two different things. And and your your pathway and journey has been really really interesting. I'm working on the rail at the top end of of youth football. I, the the first question I have is probably the the most obvious one is how did that experience at academies help prepare you for dealing with senior pros? Yeah, no, it's a it's a good question. I, I think. I think I've done it, you know, in my opinion, the right way. I've worked in every age group going from under sevens all the way through to working with 23s. And I wouldn't change that. And I think in terms of the timings of the clubs I went to, it was really important for me when I look back on my timeline. So, you know, I started at Chelsea when I was 19. You know, I was really young working at, I probably didn't realise it as much at the time, but probably working at, you know, you know, the top, if not one of the top academies in the world. Um, and then when I went to Millwall, that was a really, you know, that was a really good experience for me as well because, you know, it grounded me a little bit and taught me a little bit more about the basics and fundamentals of the game. And then just before I come to Hartford, I was at West Ham and that was, you know, that was another great time for learning where I was in with the 23s, in with the 15s and the 16s. And it, it, it prepared me because I got a really good understanding of how to develop individuals and it helped me really, you know, round myself in terms of what type of manager I wanted to be coming to this point. One thing I've noticed was since I've been over here quite a few years and I go back to watch football and you always fly into Heathrow or Gatwick. You, I think in the UK, you don't really realise that London is a unique city with football. And in America, most club cultures are typically, they typically feel a lot feel the same, uh, apart from the East Coast and West Coast. I find different, maybe the Midwest a bit different. But like in London, you mentioned three clubs there, like West Ham, Chelsea, Millwall, completely different, but all like probably half an hour from each other. Like how, how were they different in terms of their cultures and environments? Yeah, I think when you talk, first of all, when you talk about Chelsea, you, you think world class. That's the thing that comes into your head. Um, I think the players there were, were top level. The recruitment of those players was top level. You're getting the best players in the, in the area, in, 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 in London. You're getting the best raw material at the very beginning of that journey. I think at Millwall, which, you know, it's, with respect, it's the opposite. And they have to work a lot harder on finding those gems. And they do a great job of that. Um, and, and West Ham, I think the biggest difference with West Ham is West Ham were all about the individual. So it was, you know, it really... It was tailored for me, West Ham. It was all about the individual and maximising the individual strengths. So even though, like you say, Gary, they're, they're you know half an hour away from one another, I suppose the differences were, were massive and they could have been in different parts of the world. So it, it was really interesting. And I think, I think working at those three places for the periods that I did has, has really helped my development on understanding different ways to develop people and players. Well, that's kind of the road we're going to go down initially with... I mentioned there the Euros to start with. So many English players that are performing on that world stage that came through, you, you know, Chelsea have created and you work with some unbelievable players there. When you talk about that level of talent, like what stands out to you when you think of their formative years, you know, like at 9, 10, 11, 12, Tammy Abrams, uh, Mason Mount, those types of players uh, Declan Rice, like what stands out and how were those players, I suppose, brought through? I think, I think 
my first experience when I walked in the door at Chelsea to get my kit, there was an under 10s game going on and um, Mick, Mickey Bill was taking the game and there was a lad in the middle of the pitch that could move really well, could take the ball, had fantastic close control, he could outplay 1v1. And after the game, I said to Mick, I said, who's that? He said, his name's Declan Rice. Um, and that was my first introduction. I would say those players were all fantastic movers, were all fantastic movers with the ball as well and had an ability to take a player on. And then what we would do across their, you know, their, those years in the academy is we would just add to their game and check and challenge. But I think the biggest part of their development, Gary, was each other. I think, you know, I'm a big believer in sparring partners. And I think they're sparring every day, constantly with each other, still sharp and still, doesn't it? And I think that was the biggest part of those players' development. If you asked any of them, it was who they trained with week in, week out. I'm going to reference uh, our, our mutual friend Saul, uh, the interview you did with uh, my personal football coach, Saul Isaac and Hurst. When, when you talked to him, uh, a few things jumped out of me. One of the things was when I asked you about session design, you talked about doing it for the top shooting name and for the top players, impact the top players. How, how do you do that at a club where there's so many top players? Yeah, that's a great question. I think when, you know, when you've got, when you've got, players in your group uh, you know that at that particular moment in time they're the top three or four it's much easier to design a session but when you know when they're all potentially top players and you don't have a crystal ball I think you have to really put in forensic detail within your planning to make sure that you understand what the super strengths of each individual are and how you how you kind of you know balance that off with what you want from the session my my development in terms of session planning has just it's moved on throughout the years. When I was at Chelsea, I used to just keep a little black book with all of the boys' names in it and just two things that they needed to work on. And it was either what they were really, really good at that I wanted to make them you know, elite at or something where I felt like there was a hole in their game that could be exposed. And that's all I did at Chelsea. At Millwall, because I worked with the older age groups, I moved that, I moved that individual process on with my planning because we was able to do extras before and after training sit down and do a little bit more video. And it, it wasn't until, Gary, I went to West Ham where I actually started to formalise it because they already had an individual development plan package for their players. So each player at the club had a plan but also had a mentor. So when I went into West Ham, I was, uh, I was, I was coaching one of the age groups, but I was also, and those six individuals wasn't necessarily in my age group. They was all, all across the age groups. And, you, you know, your focus was to do clips with them, to do extras with them before or after training, to, to do all sorts of them. So in terms of planning and, and, and reviewing on, on do that with so many good players, you've just got to be really conscious of what they need. And, and that's been a real base of my, my philosophy as a coach. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting on what you're saying there. I, I, what I'm reading is that you're saying that IDPs, Sometimes you started with like almost as an informal IDP where you're just basically circling biggest strength, weakness to try and improve. And then I suppose what I'm going to ask you is, do you think sometimes that people spend too much focus on making sure an IDP looks really good on a spreadsheet without actually getting around and, and constant communicating with the player? 100, 100%. I, I think... I think the most important thing is the action, is actually putting it into place. If you don't happen to write it down, you can get better at that. You can improve that really quickly. But I do think I completely agree with you. When you're planning a session, even when you're planning how you restart when the ball goes dead, when the ball goes out of play, can you put in a creative restart? If I have a goal scorer in my team, a number nine, how many shots is he getting in a training session? How many chances is he getting to finish? So rather than the ball going out and us firing a ball in randomly, it will be, I might say to one of my assistants, put a ball in the box, let him know you're going to put it in the box. He's got to work on his runs across the front post. Let's do 10 of those. Let's do 10 front to away and go on the back post. Let's be creative with it. That straight away then, just, just through having those restarts, you're working on some of those individual points and those actions. And you just got to really make sure that once you've got your session out in front, and you know that your objectives that you want from the group, you then need to look at the objectives you want from the individual and how they sync together. And it's, listen, it does take careful planning, but I, I really truly believe it's the way forward. 
sometimes as coaches we get more into the collective as a mistake i've definitely made work with players you know you go into this tactical mindset then you start to try and solve and you move away from individuals and it almost restricts you as a coach to not even connect them with players but it also restricts you to to sometimes set them to sessions up they're a little bit more enjoyable and dynamic aren't they yeah no completely and I, I think i've been you know we've been speaking for a while about some of our practices as well and i do also think it's really important that as much as you want to keep everything fresh with the players uh, you know i was certainly guilty in my younger years of probably trying to always have a brand new session every time I coached. And I think what you have to be conscious of is if you're doing a practice for 15 minutes, probably the first 10 minutes, the players are still trying to work out what the rules are, how big the pitch is. Am I allowed to take the ball in here? Am I on two touch? Am I on unlimited touch? And they're not actually improving. They're learning the practice, not learning the game. So I think you've got to be really conscious of that. When you revisit some of your best practices, you'll notice that you get better returns from them because the players know what to do and they can concentrate on their individual bits as well. You mentioned, uh, and he didn't go into this and I really wanted to, to hear, you mentioned Steve Salas's influence on you on creative session design. And obviously I know his work on, on social media. I know he does a lot in psychology and he was, I think, a director of education at Millwall, if, if, I'm, if I'm right. How did he, yeah, how did he impact your session design? What, what, what was the process behind that? Steve would, it was always over a coffee with Steve, always over a coffee. Um, and Steve would always give me a lot of, you know, a lot of confidence in terms of if I was explaining something or explaining how I was going to explain to the players, he would always check me on it and say, hold on, say that again. What did you just say? Brilliant. Make sure you use that word or make sure you use that phrase with the players so it sticks. And Steve's always been really complimentary towards myself about my language that I use with the players. And he references it in his, in his book, but he was he was really good. Not necessarily about the design of what was going on, more about the design of what was being said. And that's something that I've really tried to, to keep, you know, moving forwards. What about McBeal? I know he was a big influence at Chelsea, and I know a lot of coaches were here. Well, he, he's just done some phenomenal. He's so mm. so uh, available to the coaching community around the world and, and um i've been fortunate enough to, to chat to myself what how was mick and, and how did he challenge you or support you yeah i, I mean well, first and foremost i i, I played mick, mick was my coach as a, as, a, as a kid i played at one of his local um futsal centers that he used to run and then i started to, to coach with him and i think the best thing to, best thing to use best word to use with mick is inspiration so I'm sure whenever people listen to to Mick on his podcast, they feel inspired, and you know I'm, he, he's one of my best mates. So I get inspired every day if I if I speak to him about the game. Like you said, he's always available. He's got a fantastic brain, fantastic brain. He sees the game, you know, in such a beautiful way, and the, you know the way that I I like to try and see the game as well. And we share a lot of ideas. But he he you know he gave me my job at Chelsea initially, and was really good on on helping me you know, round my ideas towards individually developing players. And, it, you know, I'm, he's someone that I'm sure everyone else looks to in, in, in that aspect as well. Um, you said that the best CPD for you at Chelsea was work with players that made much more of a competent coach. What do this, the design of the session? Was it finding ways to challenge them? Was it seeing them play, solve problems, being inspired? Or, or, or how did that process go? Yeah, do you know what, Gary? It was all of the above. So I've got so many examples. I think if I talk about, so there's a lad that's recently left Reading and gone to Crystal Palace, Michael Elise, and he was, I'd, you know, I'd argue he was probably the best player in the country in his age group. Genuinely, he he could do anything. And my challenge and my job at times in sessions was to actually man mark him to keep him engaged because he found it really easy. He found everything really easy. So when he was playing with his own age group, sometimes, he, you know, he wouldn't be able to, to focus as much. So there it was about trying to set, you know, trying to really challenge him. Sometimes I would actually just have to, you know, potentially demo and join in some of the training sessions just, just to challenge him a little bit more. So that was one. Sometimes you tactically challenge the players, but hide them from the tactics. So, you know, as I spoke about before with people, work of a lot of really, really good 1v1 players. So at Chelsea, I used to play those players at the back just purely so they'd have more players to beat when they pick the ball up. 
in the system. So you'd play you play some of the boys at right back rather than high in a four, you know, high in a, as a winger. Just say they've got one extra or two extra to beat, just to enhance them. So it'd be, you know, be a little bit social, a little bit psychological, a little bit tactical. But as long as there's a why, and I think that's really important to get across, I'll always ask myself why I'm doing something. So as long as I know what my why is, and then ultimately the players understand what the why is, that's the most important thing. When you making that transition now and, and moving your journey forward, when did you, I suppose, have aspirations? Did you always have aspirations for the, the senior game or was it something that you've only looked at recently or how did that process go? Yeah, I mean, listen, I'll be really honest. I think when I first started, I was in too much of a rush. Um, and, I, you know, Mickey always used to say to me, stay cool, you'll get there, calm down. You know, I, I wanted to I wanted to manage England when I was 19. It was, you know, I was, I was one of those coaches. But what, what I started to develop slowly was a really good affinity with the feeling of being, trying to be world-class at my particular job. And, you, you know, I'm never going to be world-class, but I'll thought to myself, can I try and be better every day? So if I'm the under-9s coach at Chelsea, can I be the best one in the world? If I'm on the under-15s and under-16s coach at Millwall, can I be the best in the world? What does that look like? And I've always had aspirations to manage. Um, and when this opportunity came up here at Hartford, you know, I took it with both hands because I'll be honest, Gary, I didn't feel like at 30 years of age I was going to get an opportunity to to manage you know, professionally at that age um, at this level. When the, when the opportunity came with Hartford, um, was that something that you, it took you a while to think about or was this something you jumped at? I mean, it's a, it's a big step. Yeah, you, you, listen, you always have to take everything into consideration. I was at a top club in West Ham, working with top people and top players. Um, I had access to various age groups. Um, but for me, my pathway there wasn't as good as the one at Hartford. Um, and I got, a, I got a random phone call. I was, you know, I was on a motorway in England. got a random phone call from a guy called Paul Buckle, who's a technical advisor here. And he just, you know, he asked me a couple of things and introduced himself and told me about the club and just just said, would I like to speak with him and the owner? And they'd heard a few things about me um, and, and, and went from there. When I looked at the, the, the league, I looked at the project, I looked at how they wanted to shape the club, very young club. You know, it, it worked hand in hand with, you know, the next step in, in my career. Like I said at the beginning, I've worked with under nines all the way through to under 23s. And I think it was the right time for me to make that step. And Paul asked me one really, really key question. And he said to me, what's, you know, what's your pathway? What's your development pathway? He said, because I've got one for you. I've got a development pathway for you. And that was something which I've done for years with players. And sometimes it's really important to have that for yourself. I've got a plan for all my players. But, you know, if someone's got one for me as well, then that's fantastic. And that was what really got me over the line with this role. Yeah, we're seeing more and more coaches, even Eric Ramsey earlier this week going to Manchester United. We're seeing more more clubs that are employing full-time individual development coaches from a senior level. So I, I wanted to ask you, first of all, do you think it's a necessity in the, in the game today? And then second of all, how do you merge it as a head coach with such an individual focus? How do you kind of balance that collective individual? Yeah, I mean, listen, I'm certainly in, in favour of anything that supports individual development. My answer to this is probably, you know, it's not going to be everyone's cup of tea, but my, my, you know, my question would be, why is that not going on anyway? If you're not developing individuals, what are you doing? So I would, you know, I'll definitely check that. But on the back of that, I, I would also say I've got a real good appreciation now of what it is in management, what it looks like, how your time does get consumed with you know, planning, scheduling, media, meetings, scheduling meetings with staff, making sure that everything's periodically done physically, making sure that IDPs are being ticked off, making sure technical match reports are being done. So I can see where if your time's not managed correctly, you can lose that. But ultimately for me, you know, I, I would I would always say that that's got to be at the forefront of every coach's mind. But the fact that we're now being mindful of it can only be seen as a positive if it's going to be developing, you know, individuals, especially for our national team. Soccer coaches, a new season is upon us. And you know what that means? Organising, registering, scheduling and, of course, communicating with 20, 30 and maybe even 40 of your players, your coaches, your parents, your managers and the volunteers in your club. It's a lot of work, but don't worry. 
There is help at hand and that comes in the form of one of the best team management apps around for youth teams. That app is Haya. Using the Haya app will free up more coaching time so you can spend that time where it really matters, helping your players develop and helping your athletes and your people be the best versions that they can be. I've known Haya for a number of years. They've appeared on the podcast. I'd strongly recommend that you at least go and give their app a try and pass it on to another coach who could benefit from saving the time on team administrations this season. It's free to download in the Haya app as well as for your team to use. Just follow the link in the notes below or you can simply type in Haya, H-E-J-A, directly into the App Store right now. Thanks so much to Haya for all the support. Thanks so much for supporting our sponsors. We couldn't make the podcast work without us. When we met a couple of months ago, um, we were both staying in the same hotel with different teams. The one thing I noticed with your team was the amount of interactions you were having with your players. It seemed to be not just meetings, but there seemed to be you know, chats in the lobby, different parts of the hotel. Uh, we'd always see you about. I was wondering if those are planned, are those formal, informal? What's the process behind? Yeah, so I'm 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 very formal with myself. Now, I'll always write myself down three targets that I'm going to set myself for each day. So it might be, well, today I'm going to speak to this lad about this. Today I'm going to do this for this. And I'll make sure that I tick them off. So I almost plan my day like I'm planning a session. And then other things will just naturally happen. So the players won't know that it's formal. The players will think it's very informal. So when I bumped into you, I was sitting with one of our our centre forwards and it was literally just trying to make him feel good we had a game the next day and it was just talking about the things that make him feel good before a game talking about you know past experience of games where he's played well I threw a little you know a couple of little challenges in there for the next day what I wanted from from him um, but the boys you know the boys will tell you I'm really big on on my pre-match presentations I love a theme I love talking about things that have got absolutely nothing to do with the game sometimes they think I'm mad We'll have presentations on on geese, on marines, on on all sorts of things. So, but I, I I really do try and make sure that my communication is really clean with the players, and they they come away with clarity. I think that's so important that the recipient of whatever you're saying, whether it's a one to one chat, a group chat, you know, they they have got clarity on what the message, you know, what the message means. Million dollar question now. What? How have you found the difference between you know, you get a lot of young players in your squad. Those that young, that eighteen through twenty-two age group in America, and and compared to England, what are some of the differences that you've experienced? I think the first thing, Gary, that struck me was socially, the American lads are world class. If you ask them to, you know, to start a discussion, and you want to almost throw, you know, throw one in there, a question to create a debate, they're fantastic. There's no. There's no standoff attitude with them. They're really, you know, really happy to throw their opinion in in a positive way, listen, understand and engage. And that's been really refreshing, really refreshing. Um, I think that in terms of, you know, the differences, I think the level here is 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 aggressively getting better, which is fantastic. I still think that because how good our academy system is in the UK, an under 18 and a category one academy, their level in comparison to potentially the level here from a lad, you know, still at school, there is going to be a slight difference in terms of, you know, what they're getting, what their diet is in terms of their football diet throughout the week. But, you know, it's been really, really, really refreshing. And then I suppose to connect to that in terms of the style and the standard, it's really diff- It's really difficult to place the standard, but I would say it's a mixture between probably League Two in England and the 23s. Um, and the tempo's fast. There's lots of players come, you know, coming up from from South America that are fantastic travellers with the ball. So there's that ele- element to it as well. Um, so it's you know it's been a it's been a really positive influence on me certainly. What about off the pitch? Clubs typically professional clubs are set up a little bit different from England uh, with medical support and, um, and and managing you know doctors and all that. There, how have you found that? There's been more meetings than you thought. No, it's, it's not. It's not been too bad. Um, I think I've been really lucky with my journey. I've, I've obviously managed businesses as well in the UK. So I've had I've been exposed to managing quite a high number of staff, sort of 25, 30 members of staff in a room, being able to delegate, which has been really important. Um, 
But like you say, the structure over here is slightly different. You have to have a handle on everything and make sure that the, the departments are, are, you know, are on point. And that's just where people are able to be agile mentally and be able to cope with problems. But no, it's been fine. It's just been a, you know, all in all, a really refreshing experience. Hiring, hiring John, we just spoke just before we, we started recording on stage, come over. Uh, a lot of coaches would be probably really interested to know how the process of hiring an assistant coach is for a, for a, for a professional senior coach. Um, what did you outline that you were going to look for? What about him jumped out? Yeah, I think it's really important to understand where your strengths are uh, and really important to understand where your holes are. I cannot speak to a player about what it's like to play at Old Trafford in front of 60,000. I can't speak to them about that. Steady can, you know, Steady helps me with that, with that. And I think ultimately him as a person has defined my decision to bring him in. He's an absolutely outstanding person. Um, in terms of the process, I'll be completely honest with you. It was a phone call. He reached out to me out of the blue, sent me a message, said, I've followed your career. Would really like to start from ground zero and do my apprenticeship as a coach, but I want to work with the right person. So we shared a phone call for about 45 minutes. You know, I told him sort of, you know, where I see, where I see the development of what I'm trying to do and how I could potentially help him. And then he, he shared his experiences and how he could help me and add value to, to what's going on. Um, and we went from there. And since he's come in, you know, I've, I've said this before, but he is a 7 a.m. to a 7 p.m. man. His work ethic is world class, absolutely world class. And, you know, in terms of having an assistant, someone that can, protect you from things. I think that's something he does really well. He protects me from, you know, sometimes he doesn't tell me, every, you know, everything. And sometimes he'll put fires out without letting me know. And I think that's one of his really good, probably seen good assistants do that over the years. Another thing, he's really good with individuals, which links into things that, you know, I like to speak about. So he's worked with the forwards and we have really good meetings about how we're going to rely on that in training. But, you know, I couldn't have made a better decision bringing Steady in. So I'm really happy with that. That's interesting on the relationship because obviously it's it, it probably defines the the success of a, a head coach assistant coach is how they're how they you know that trust how they're going to get along the fact that you didn't know him before and the fact that he is in there seven p.m. To, or seven a.m. to seven p.m. that probably then helps spend more time together to build the relationship. Yeah, one one hundred percent. I couldn't agree. Couldn't agree more. I th I think the fact that he's you know he's got the same work ethic as I have. It really you know lends itself to us getting on. Uh, we see the game in a real real similar way. We can speak about things to a, you know to a relatively high level. And the, you know the fact that he can understand what I'm thinking and I can understand what he's thinking. You know really lends itself to hopefully us being successful. Mm. Again, back to Saul's interview. The 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 one v one which seemed to be a big, big part of your philosophy as a youth coach. How much have you taken that, that philosophy through? Uh, how much better, I suppose, yeah, how much better can you make older players technically better? Can you, do you look at it in different ways or how much of that is part of the program? Yeah, listen, I, I, I believe, Gary, I believe you can improve everybody, whether they're, whether they're 18 or 38. I think, you know, someone you meet will always know something that you don't. So, you know, if we can if we can improve everyone by 1%, we've, we've done really well. And, I, I, you know, I look at, just to give you an insight into, you know, how it works here, I had a Zoom call before I come to the country. I had a Zoom call and two phone calls with every player that we signed. You know, watched their clips. I had three different references from their past coaches that they played for or players that they played with. You know, so I had a really good insight into them as people. You know, I asked them to fill out some goal setting sheets for me on arrival in terms of what their short term, medium term, long term goals were so that we could align that. And then their individual development plan is something we sit and do together, me and the player. So it's it's an agreement. It's, you know, what do you want to improve on as well as what do I think you need to improve on? Most of the time that's aligned. And then in and around, I suppose, creating the sessions, Ultimately, we'll go from, you know, we'll go from really basic and build and build and build and add. So it will start or we'll, you know, find out right, what does the load need to be today? The physical load, you know, is it, a, you know, where is it in the week? What do we need to work on in terms of a tactical aspect? Then how do we build the session? How do we build 
build the session in terms of, like I said, creative restarts? How do we build the session in terms of sparring partners? Be really deliberate. It's got to be really deliberate. Who's playing against who and why? What's your why? Again, what's your why? When you're doing small-sided games, when you're doing 11 v 11s, who's playing against who? Which unit is playing against which unit? If you play your best 11 against your reserve 11, you're creating and getting good return from that, yes. But if you play your starting front three against your back four, you're also getting good returns from that as well. So it's about, I think, dropping the right things in at the right times and making sure that when you're creating these practices and sessions, it's done with forensic detail. It has to be done with that detail. And after we finish planning, we'll always take a step back and check things off. Is, is, our, is our centre midfielder getting something from this session? OK, what is it? Why have we done that? Is, that? is our goalkeeper getting something from this session? Even if we're working on playing out from the back, can we make sure that we start that with him coming to take a cross? And how does he come and take a cross? Does he take it under pressure? And then who is that linking to? Is that linking to the forward making a near post run? Is that work, working on the midfield? So everything is checked and challenged so that when we get on the grass that morning, the next day, everyone knows exactly what they're doing and why we're doing it. How much video is used in the pre-practice, post-practice, individual meetings? Yeah, so we'll have a TV on the side of the pitch. Um, we'll have live replays. There'll be times when we're doing shape work where I'll have my goalkeeping coach in, in the back half of the pitch, steady in the front half of the pitch. I'll be on the I'll be on the headphones upstairs and I'll be speaking to them live while that's going while that's going on and we'll be working on that just so that I can see it from a bird's eye view but still get the message to them. So it's it's as simple as just a linked a linked conference call, if you like, while we're in the middle of training. And, um, and we, you know, we just have that communication so that we can just make sure that we're not missing anything. Mm. So you're, you're playing it, recording it, and then going, uh, linking up the audio with him and then going back, back in that? Yeah, yeah, correct. So, so sometimes the players will come over and look at the TV and we'll speak to them about what we've just seen. Other times it will be a case of Steady will be in the middle of the pitch and I'll be in the top of the stand and I'll say, look, our number seven needs to come short a little bit quicker before he goes long and that pass needs to look like this and then he can address it on the pitch with the players. He'll mute himself. He'll mute himself sometimes so that I can listen to what the back half of the pitch is saying with a goalie coach but other times I'm listening to constantly what the communication is and with that you also have the ability for him to take his headset out, give it to one of the players and then I can speak to the player from where I am just to add a little bit more detail to them as well. Ah, this is fascinating. So is this, is this something that it's done? I mean, I'm sure you're not doing this every single day in terms of your position as a coach. So is this like one day a week in that session? Does it depend? Is it more of a tactical prep session? Yeah, it's always the tactical prep session. So when we do so when we do our patterns, so we do a lot of pattern mm -hmm. work on a Friday. Um, we'll do our set plays on a Friday. And that will be when I'll go in the stands and I'll watch from there. And I'll, I'll just, the guys will be mic'd up and headsetted up. And, you know, we have the TV on the halfway line. The players can come in. They look at some of the some of the feedback from the analyst um, because we think that's really important. We think that's really important to, you know, to, to making sure the finer, finer details are, are really addressed. You're probably to the aware, awareness of how big America with travel now is. You mentioned there about going down to Florida and now you're in Charleston. Um, how much... Do you then, how do you feel, I'm always fascinated by this here, uh, how do you fill the days up? I mean, it, it seemed to be pretty busy with the meetings that was a couple of months ago. Is it something that you're still building through or, or do you give it a bit of downtime and a bit of space or how much of that day is, is structured with meetings? No, I, listen, I, I think it's a balance. I think it's a balance. Like you say, the travel is really interesting. I think we travel, you know, slightly more, if not the same as what a Champions League team would in Europe. So, you know, the, the, the amount of miles that we're covering is, is frantic and it's, you know, it's, it's really eye-opening. Um, and in terms of the meetings, you know, we have a set play committee. So we have a committee of six players that will go away during the week and they'll screen grab any set pieces that they like on the TV and then present them, present them to me once a week. We have a senior leadership group, which I know goes on at most clubs, but again, that's, they'll meet with Steady and just speak about things that they think we can improve or things that they've liked. And that helps us streamline our ideas of what the players want. Um, we have unit meetings. So the unit meetings are really good because boys are sat down with the analysts and they go through their clips. 
and then we we sometimes move the players from one unit to another to relay information about what they want. So what do the forwards need from the fullbacks when they pick the ball up? Well, you're only going to know if you speak to each other. So mm. you know, we, we make sure we, we do that. And I think the other thing you shared, which is really important, is to understand when to rest and recover, when to allow, you know, when to allow the players to just go up to their rooms and just relax, when to turn a pool session into potentially a, you know, a, a competitive head volley session, something like that. It's it's about, I think it's it's really about feeling with that, Gary, and feeling where the players are at that particular moment in time. Sure, like with all this travel, you've probably had about 10 delays and, and it's kind of out of your hands with that there. They might have been a pizza hut and, and as a coach, you're probably going, oh, this is a, how, how do you manage the, the diet and how do you get through that there? Has that surprised you a bit? What we've put into place probably after the first three games was almost like a checklist, a quality assurance checklist. So we will pre-plan wherever we go, what we're going to eat and where we're going to eat it from. And we always get that couriered in to make sure that the players are getting the right things. Sometimes if there's a delay or sometimes like this weekend, we've had to move hotels because we got the booking slightly wrong. Sometimes, you you know, you should, I think the best thing to say with that, Gary, is you've just got to be agile. You have to be agile and be able to, you know, really try and deal and put put those fires out as they as they come about. As you know, and as I know, coming over to this to this country, the food is outstanding, and you have to you have to really try and you know try and limit yourself to to a certain amount. Especially me, um, I'm definitely a size bigger than I was when I arrived. But with regards to the players, we try and manage that relatively well. Fantastic. All right, last couple for you. The I mean, on top of on the addition to that there, the lifestyle, is there anything that you've, you know, the world is kind of going back to normal a little bit. I know it's been restricted for a fair bit with the COVID, but have you been getting out and about? Have you been experiencing the American lifestyle? Yeah, yeah, we've, we've tried to. I think, I think obviously with, with my wife not being here, I've just really chucked myself into the job full time and just really tried to engross myself in that. And, and then when she has come over, which she's over at the moment, it's been really good to spend some time with her and go out and you know and see see the city, which has been great. But it's a fantastic place to work. You know, like I said to you before we come come on live, I was in Tampa on Tuesday, and that's a fantastic place. We go to Miami, we go to New York. So, you know, it's it's not a hard life doing this at all. I'm very very fortunate to see some of these places. Pre match routine. It's so intense being a, a, a manager and, and at the professional level with so much pressure and decisions have to be made at such a short period of time. Um, how do you build up for, a, say, a 7 p.m. game? What would that day look like um, match day? Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest, Gary, I'm really, really chilled on a match day, really chilled. I, I take it as time to decompress and relax because I take my confidence from the work we put in in the week, take my confidence from that. I know that when it comes to obviously 7 p.m., I'm going to have to make going to have to make some big decisions. I'm going to have to potentially, you know, take players off the pitch and you know and upset them a little bit because you know they all want to play 90 minutes. But that's my job. Uh, I, I really, I really embrace it. My routine is, you know, I get up like normal. I make sure I go and get myself a coffee. I'll have a, I'll have a little think about the game in terms of the what ifs. I'll make sure that I. You know, sort of think about the what if so that it doesn't come as a surprise. You know, what if we go 2 0 down really early? What if we go 2 0 up really early? What if it's a stalemate? You know, am I going to gamble and change it or am I going to, you know, wait and be patient? So I think about those things. Then for me, I normally watch a film and I have a nap. I have a nap at about 2 pm, a couple of hours, and I'll get up. I've got my little playlist that I listen to on the way to the game. Lionel Richie gets. Gets gets a fair amount of uh, of attention when I'm on the way to the game, and then and then it's about I think really important. I always make sure the players see me smiling when I come in, and then you know I'll prepare a, a small small team talk in my head. But most of the time it's just from the heart. You know, it's about talking to them about taking their confidence from the person that's in front of them, in terms of the people in the locker room, what they're willing to do for one another, what they're willing to go through for one another, and then the people watching at home. And then we, we go to war together, and that's what we do every week. Yeah, uh, just in the social media, following you and, and looking at the messages that you're trying to build this really strong spirit within the team. Is that something that, that is worked on every single day? Is that through? Do you have a lot of speeches that galvanize the group, or, or how do you go about that? Yeah, I think, I think we try to create a real competitive environment. One thing 
which I would never want to be associated with a team of mine, is that we would be soft. I think the way we play in terms of with the ball, a lot of teams that try and play our style are easy to beat when they don't have the ball. And I don't want that with us. I want us to defend the goal of our lives. I want us to be compact. I want us to go and press aggressively. Um, and it, Gary, it's all of those buzzwords that all of the, you know, every coach in the world wants their team to look like, you know, Liverpool out of possession, high press, you know, really aggressive and Barcelona with the ball. But it's how you go about it, I think. And how you, those, you know, those little meetings that we spoke about earlier, those individual meetings, those collective meetings, as long as they're themed and they're planned and your message is consistent from day one, you'll start to create that type of environment. Young coaches watching this, obviously, just from the both sides of your journey. So with the youth, you know, you mentioned they're starting at, at 19. Um, that's a really young age to go. But we're seeing now with coaches that, that are starting younger and younger and going through their education, their development. What uh, what advice do you have for coaches that are looking at at following a similar path to yourself, youth and the senior and the pro? I would say first thing I would say is really get the hours in. So what stood me in such good stead is you know I've I've gone into primary schools and worked with thirty year one children that are running around in a sports hall that I've got to try and control and engage, and I've got to try and engage all of them. And then I've worked, I've, you know, I've had an under 23 session where I've got a Reese Oxford plan in the session who's on more money than, than I could ever imagine to be on. And I've also got to try and engage him as well. But the only way I've been able to engage someone like him is by doing the hours previously and making sure that I understand how to engage people. I would say coach as many sessions as you can, watch as many sessions as you can. And you know what? Don't be afraid to ask questions of people. I think... You know, we, we live in a world now where we're very, very fortunate. You can look at videos of anyone coaching in the world, but I don't think you can put a price on sitting down with a coach and just, you know, a little Q&A of why did you do this? How did you feel when you went through this? This is what I'm going through at the moment. Do you have any advice for me? Um, and then the last thing I would say in terms of advice is try and try and identify two or three mentors. So people you really respect and people that are willing to give you their time and really try and lean on those. And the reason why I say two or three is because one person's opinion is fantastic. But if you've got three different opinions and they're all leading towards the same way on a particular topic, then that advice that you're getting is probably going to be the right advice. And, you know, I've got, I'd say, five or six mentors that I really, really trust. And, you know, I ask them constantly, I ask them, how do I come across when I'm doing the media? Do you think I'm coming across in the right way? How did my team look when they played the other night? Do we look good enough with the ball? And these people that I've got in my life, I trust them because they'll give me clean feedback, honest, clean feedback. And I'll respect it. I might not like it, but I'll respect it. And I'll ask them, I'll ask them because I trust them. Has that been difficult then doing, you know, working so far away from from home, I'm sure if that was if it was at Chelsea or if it was at Millwall or West Ham, those mentors are sometimes more accessible because you may be working with them. Has it been something that you had to be more planning, more specific about every Tuesday I need to call such and such or Wednesday? Or has that been difficult, challenging? Yeah, absolutely. The time zone, the time zone can be difficult at times, especially when you're asking for feedback on your game. So back home, our games kick off at midnight. So Apart from, uh, you know, apart from the family and my wife, no one's watching the games. So, that, you know, when I'm asking for, for feedback on the games, that can sometimes be be quite difficult. But I think you just have to manage it, Gary. Like you said, it's spot on. I, you know, I know that on my way into work, when I'm driving into work at 6am, I know that it's 11 in the morning or 12, you know, 12 noon. So I can ring Mickey up and say, how are you? You know, how's, how's, how's your pre-season going at Rangers? Did you watch our game the other night? What did you think? Did you like this player? It's just about, you know, structuring it properly. And that lends itself again to what I said earlier about if I'm setting myself targets throughout the day, sometimes it will be setting myself targets. So I need to I need to ring the wife today. I need to make sure I ring the wife. I need to make sure I speak to a Steve Salis or a Paul Buckle or a Michael Bill or a Liam Manning. I need to speak to those guys and reach out because it's really important that you do that. It's, it's so easy to get engrossed and lost in this job because it's so full on. So just setting yourself time aside to, you know, to improve yourself with other people's evaluations and opinions is so important. Yeah. 
Fantastic. I just want to have for you, this is just from a personal, uh, an observation almost of, of listening to how you construct your environment sessions. You mentioned about uh, the forensic. So uh, even taking that there and applying it to being formal about which players you're targeting and then setting it up in an informal way. Like, just like, the level of planning behind all that there uh, is natural your personality or that something that you've had to work at to get to that there? I think, if I'm being honest, it's part of my, it's definitely part of my makeup. how I've been brought up um, to try and, to try and control the controllables as much as I can. And I also think it comes from really good discussions in the mornings and in the evenings with, with my staff of, right, what do we want from tomorrow, fellas? What do, what do we want? If we want to get this out, how are we going to do it? Let's let's you know. Let's be really creative with if we if we've got a go, if we've got a goal scorer that's not scoring goals, let's find out why. Let's help him. Let's fill him with self belief. And how we're going to do that within you know within a training environment and then within within an informal environment, it might be a case of you know steady. Go and take him out for a coffee. Tell him how good he is. Just tell him how good he is. And then in training, let's make sure that we serve him with real quality chances where you know he's going to score. And, you know, we're, we're creating that environment where we do that. But I think it's more natural. It's something I've had to I've had to get better at, as you do. You, you never fall on your feet with anything. And uh, again, down to my journey of managing staff within the business has helped me do that. Because, you know, when you delegate and you delegate with a structure, it's really important to, to make sure that you're in control of those things. Fantastic. Fantastic. Harry, this has flown by. We'll have to do another one, maybe a mid-season report and then a final one. No, Gary, I've, I've loved it, really loved it. Like, you know, obviously I'm bang smack in the middle of a journey now and trying to improve every day. But to go over some of the, you know, some of the things from the past that, you know, West Ham's and Millwall's and Chelsea's has been really good. And no, thank you for having me on. I've loved it.